Well, welcome back, everyone, and thanks for coming. This week, we've been talking about cohort studies. And one of the cohort study designs we've been mentioning is the prospective cohort study design. And I've asked my friend and colleague, Eric Rim, to come and present you a paper that you'll ask to be read that uses the prospective cohort study design. He's going to give you some questions to discuss. And you'll be able to do that on our discussion forum. And after that period, after a few days, he's going to come back and he's going to give you his opinions, his answers to those questions, and also maybe comment on some of the answers that you gave. But before you talk about that paper, Eric, I'd like you to uh, also tell us something about the cohort study that is the basis for that, uh, that paper. Remember, we had Mayor Stanford here talking about the nurses' health study. Eric runs a different cohort study here at the School of Public Health, and he'll talk about it. But even before that, I've asked this to all our, our critique of literature uh, leaders. When did you first decide you wanted to be an epidemiologist? What drove you into this field? And what was the uh, reason for taking this up? So if you'd give us a little bit of personal history for us, that'd be great. And then tell us about the cohort study and tell us about the paper. So Eric, place is yours. Thanks, Fran. And uh, hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, it's my, my history uh, into epidemiology may be slightly different than most. It turns out my father was an epidemiologist, and uh, I grew up in Wisconsin, and actually I didn't quite know what he did. I knew that he did a, a fair bit with statistics, but I didn't quite understand it. So when I went to college undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, actually I, like my older brother and older sister, was pre-med, uh, had a great d desire for biology and uh, a great interest in research. I worked in a genetics lab for about two and a half years, running gels and doing all sorts of great things for other faculty members and postdocs there. Um, and after about two and a half years of that, I said, boy, I really like research, but I don't really like sitting in a lab uh, the whole day. And so I had a, a great interest in computers and numbers, so I actually switched my, my major over to computer science. And I was a fantastic programmer and had great interests in trying to use computer science for numbers. But I also knew I didn't want to be a programmer my whole life. Um, there was something about uh, staying up till 3 o'clock in the morning working on homework scuts that turned me away from uh, looking into that for a profession. And it turns out epidemiology is sort of a mix between being an expert in biology and also being really great at understanding and being able to manipulate numbers. So I guess I found epidemiology by mistake. I then worked for an epidemiologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, Dr. Teresa Young who really opened my eyes, uh, along with my father, into understanding of what epidemiology was, which led me to graduate school here and to then the faculty here at, at the Harvard School of Public Health. So with that, let me start. Um, as Dr. Cook mentioned, I'd like to talk a little bit about the health professionals follow-up study as introduction to this paper. I know other experts have presented uh, papers uh, uh, far and wide from the literature. I thought I would present one of ours uh, just because it has a really interesting new twist on a way to study the, uh, prospectively to study the incidence of chronic disease. In this case, I'll be talking about diabetes. So let me start, start with the cohort and give you a, a little bit of background there. I know that Dr. Stamford was here earlier and talked to you about the Nurses Health Study, which started in 1976. And obviously there are some differences between studying women and men. You, you can't study prostate cancer in the Nurses Health Study. There was uh, a lot of other interests. Uh, once we got into studying uh, diet in the nurses' health study, it turns out there weren't a lot, if any, really large prospective studies on diet in men. So in 1986, we initiated the health professionals follow-up study, and several of the colleagues are listed below. But this whole group uh, now works together, and it's really a group of 50 to 75 faculty members and postdocs that work with this data. But the health professionals follow-up study, um, the, the, the way the methods work is that we send questionnaires out every two years uh, to cohort members. And um, the, the, uh, the study initially was 51,529 male health professionals answered that first questionnaire in 1986. And the men were between the ages of 40 and 75. You know, why choose that age range? Well, we wanted to capture uh, individuals that were early enough so they didn't all have a chronic disease. And we also wanted to be able to look at a, a range of different types of diseases. Some neurologic diseases may hit men in their 40s and 50s, um, and then other diseases like cancer or heart disease may occur later in life. So we have a really broad range. And then um, we, like the nurses' health study, we actually went to male health professionals. 
there weren't enough male nurses to make a large enough cohort. So we tried to come up with you know, what professions could we contact where people may have a keen interest in being part of the study that would keep response rates up over time. So we actually went to the American Dental Association and got collaborators from each one of these professional organizations such that we could work with them. We got their mailing lists. We sent out mailings to every dentist in the United States between the ages of 40 and 75 uh, to see if to recruit them into the study. Now, you would hope that, or our dream was that we would get 50% response. But in the United States, that's a challenge. We actually got in the range of about 25 to 30% response after doing two or three mailings to recruit 51,529 uh, 51, men into the study. So one question, actually one question that maybe I don't even have on my list of questions, but um, I'm happy to discuss with you, is what's the advantage or disadvantage of using male health professionals? That always comes up when people are starting studies. There are issues of response, there's issues of generalizability. So really, what are the strengths and weaknesses of using you know, relatively well-off individuals who are professionals already, they all had, they were all members of their professional organization, so they all had jobs. Um, so the, that's kind of a question you can think about as I go through this, is how this impacts results of prospective studies that use the male health professional study. So as the study progressed, and as I said, we mail questionnaires every two years, and it takes us about 18 months to do a cycle, a, a two-year cycle of mailing, because not everybody responds the first time around. We get about 65% of the men who return their questionnaire within the first week or two. And it's a scannable questionnaire, one that you're all probably familiar with. But we then actually do repeated mailings to non-responders up to about five or six times to get our response rates up high. Because ultimately, the validity of any cohort study is how well you can document the endpoints and how well you can have follow-up over time. So, Usually by our fifth or sixth mailing, we've made a much smaller questionnaire so that we just get details on have you been diagnosed with any diseases in the last two years. And so an individual, for instance, who fills out the 1990 questionnaire and tells us that they had, let's say, uh, colon cancer diagnosed back here, we mail back to them to get permission to uh, retrieve their medical records and get where they were diagnosed. We then can mail to the, uh, their doctor or their pathologist and we get the records, in this case for colon cancer, so that physicians here can review and confirm that it was a colon cancer and, and, and uh, document all the different subtypes that we may be interested in looking at. And so we do that every two years. And over time, uh, we now have uh, uh, about 30 or 5 or 40 percent of the cohort has actually passed away. So we've been able to document the cause of death. But we also have thousands and thousands of incident coronary heart disease events. Uh, five and six and eight thousand diabetes events. So that's as time has gone on and the men have aged, we've documented a lot of incident uh, chronic disease events, and that allows us to go back. So if we document a lot of colon cancers here, a lot of heart disease or diabetes, because the data, the study is prospective, it allows us to go back and look at what their diets were early on to see if we could predict who it is that will get colon cancer or diabetes. So the, another strength of the study. Um, is that as time has gone on, we've wanted to uh, augment the type of data that we were getting from questionnaires. So in 1994, we asked all of the men if they would return a blood sample to us. Now, these men are across the country, so they, had, they couldn't come into our clinics here. So we asked them if they would return a blood sample, and we actually sent them a Federal Express kit, which had everything they needed to return 30 uh, cc's of, blood to, of whole blood to us overnight on an ice pack, and, we, and then we process them in the lab here. So now we have 18,000 bloods that are stored, and this becomes its own cohort within a cohort. So now we can look prospectively at blood markers that we can measure here, or as Dr. Mucci discussed with you, we can do nested case control studies where we can take 500 men who develop heart disease after they gave us blood and 500 controls that are the exact same age, and we can go back and measure their blood to see if we can come up with new novel markers that predict who it is that will have heart disease subsequent to their donation of their blood to us. And we've also collected other biological samples. We have toenails collected at baseline. And that's for measuring trace metals like mercury or arsenic or other trace metals that your body excretes through toenails. We have tissue blocks on about 50% of all cancers, uh, hard tissue uh, cancers that have been diagnosed. And we've also collected cheek cells now 
uh, because not everybody gave us blood. And so if we want DNA samples from individuals, you can get them from a, a quick swish and spit sample that you can get that people can send us through the mail and we can extract DNA from that, from DNA from the inside of the cheek cell. So the study continues on. Every two years we've done mailings to individuals uh, to continue the, the cohort to document new incident diseases. And I think one of the unique aspects of these studies, the Nurses Health Study and the Health Professionals Follow-up Study, is that we actually go back every four years to measure diet. Um, and most prospective cohort studies out there that have looked at diet and chronic disease have a single baseline measure. And that's not bad, and that's a great way to look prospectively, but when you get out 20 years or 15 years, people's diets change, and actually the food supply changes. So a lot about what you're assigning as their main exposure changes. So this allows us to look over time at uh, how, what those changes, what changes have occurred and how they may impact uh, chronic disease. And that's actually the topic for the paper that I hope you read today, is to look at changes in alcohol consumption and how they impact someone's subsequent risk of diabetes. So um, this is the setting for the, for the paper today. And uh, as I said, we, every two years, we go back and document someone's incident uh, disease status. In this case, it was diabetes. We went back and got information on how they were diagnosed to determine if we could confirm if it was a, di a, a truly incident diabetes by uh, national diabetes standards. And um, what we've done, and, and I'll show you in a bit more detail, is to look at change in alcohol intake over time and how it predicts subsequent risk of diabetes. So before I talk about alcohol, I know it's a, somewhat of a touchy, touchy subject, so I just want to get some definitions out, and these are detailed in the paper, because we talk about people that are non-drinkers, light drinkers, moderate drinkers, and then heavy drinkers. And every culture is slightly different, and in the U.S., the dietary guidelines define moderate drinking this way, is that for women, it's no more than one drink a day, and for men, it's no more than two drinks a day. And what's unique about that is that the amount of alcohol in a common beverage is almost the same. So if you have a 12 ounce beer, or you have a five ounce glass of wine, or you have a shot of spirits like gin or vodka, the amount of actually alcohol in each one of those is almost the same. And it's in the range of 13 to 14 grams of, of ethanol per beverage. And that's the way that this study looked at uh, trying to look at what happens when people change their intake over time and how it impacts their risk of diabetes. All right, so just a little background. There's been a hundred studies, at least, prospective cohort studies that have looked at alcohol and heart disease. And this is probably one of the most consistent findings in the literature. And this was actually one of the first papers I published working with the health professionals follow-up study. The numbers here are just the rates of coronary heart disease. So this is incident rates of coronary heart disease. And almost all prospective cohort studies find this relationship, that if you have non-drinkers and light drinkers down here, and you look at their relative risk or their rate of uh, coronary heart disease, what you see is that people who drink less than a drink or one to two drinks a day have a significantly lower risk of developing heart disease than people who don't drink at all. Now, we don't have a lot of really heavy drinkers in the cohort, so people out here, we have three, four, and five drinks a day. In some, of the, in some other studies where they have a lot of really heavy drinkers, what you see is this curve starts to go up. So it's really, the difference really is down here, moderate drinkers have a lower risk of heart disease than, than non-drinkers. So what's going on? Why is that? And this will get at some of the reason why we did the diabetes study, is that we know in really short-term studies and cross-sectional studies that alcohol in moderation, one to two drinks a day, actually is quite good for your HDL cholesterol, your good cholesterol. It reduces your blood's propensity to clot, so it decreases fibrinogen levels. And also, now there's some really good research that it increases insulin sensitivity. So that really led to our interest in studying alcohol and diabetes was because there is this component to the benefit that if that is an important part of lowering heart disease, then maybe alcohol moderation also is important for lowering risk of diabetes. So our first investigation of this came when we had a, a visiting scholar from Australia working with me to look in the health professionals follow-up study. Again, this was more of just a baseline measure in 1986. What did they drink and what was their risk of diabetes over time? So for the most part, we ignored all those follow-up questionnaires where people may have changed their alcohol consumption and we just looked at baseline. And here, we found that the reduction in risk was even stronger for diabetes than what was reported for heart disease. You can see that the relative risk in the one to two drinks a day 
is 0.64 compared to non-drinkers or light drinkers. So this is a 36% reduction in risk of developing diabetes in these middle-aged men for moderate drinkers compared to non-drinkers. And now, this was one of the first studies of this, but this has been seen in about seven or eight different uh, cohort studies where you see a moderate alcohol consumption lowers risk of diabetes. But then we said, well, people change over time, so how can we capture that and to see if there's actually short-term changes in risk of diabetes for people who, uh, as we track people over time. So let me, let me just show you what was done in the paper, and hopefully as you read this, this became apparent. But what we did is we looked at individuals' change in alcohol from this cycle to this cycle and predicted would they get diabetes over the next four years. And then if you look at the next one, if we go backwards, we then at, we moved over time to look at change of alcohol every four years and their subsequent risk of diabetes, and this went through 2008. So you can see we have a lot of four-year time periods we're looking at change of alcohol and then their subsequent change in, in risk of diabetes. And that really was unique. No one else had looked at it this way, looked at sort of the short-term impact in alcohol. And we don't know why people chose to change their alcohol consumption. Some people, uh, for whatever reason, gave it up. Some people started to drink a little bit more. Maybe they're, they had more stress in their life. Maybe they had retired all these reasons why people may have changed their alcohol consumption. But when you have 50,000 men, that gives you a lot of statistical power to look at the impact of change in alcohol and risk of diabetes. So this slide, this figure is not in the paper, but it's actually made from data that's in one of the later tables. And this really illustrates uh, the impact of change in alcohol on risk of diabetes. And let's just take the light drinkers first. So on the bottom is their consumption at the beginning of any four-year period. So these were the light drinkers, and the, the reference group is people that were light drinkers and stayed light drinkers over the four-year period. So that, that's a relative risk of one. That's the reference group. Now, all these other groups are people that are compared to that reference group. So what is their relative risk of developing diabetes compared to people that were light drinkers and stayed light drinkers? And that light includes non-drinkers. So if you were a light drinker and you became a moderate drinker, that would be this group. So you went from light to moderate. Your risk of diabetes was about 27, 25% lower than those people who stayed light drinkers. So then let's look at this group. These are people that were moderate and stayed moderate. If you, over that four year period, drank less, your risk actually went up. If you drank more, your risk went down. So in each group, it looks like going to drink a little bit more actually reduced your risk of diabetes. Drinking a little bit less actually increase your risk. Now, this is heavier drinkers. These are people who drank more than two drinks a day. Now, this is a little tricky. Obviously, there's um, all sorts of other interpret and all sorts of uh, cultural issues related to this. And maybe we will or maybe we won't make a recommendation to drink more or less. And that's one of the questions we'll get at the end. But look at people that were heavy drinkers at the beginning of any four-year period. If they went from heavy to moderate, the risk of diabetes actually went up slightly. If they went from heavy to being a light drinker, their risk of diabetes went up. Now, they all had lower risk than the, the reference group, which is people that stayed essentially light or non-drinkers. But uh, it is kind of intriguing that there's so many four-year cycles that we have enough statistical power to look at the impact of what happens when you drink a little bit more or drink a little bit less. And this maybe speaks to the biology of what's going on, that changing your alcohol intake over a relatively short period of time actually does, in a very short period of time, increase your insulin sensitivity, which will reduce your risk of diabetes. So you can see this is in the table. I believe it's in table three or four. The numbers that correspond to these bars are there. So you can match up the numbers to the bars. All right, so let's talk about some of the questions that would go along with this paper. Really, what's the main scientific question being asked in this paper? And that's, you know, what did the authors, what was their hypothesis going in? What was the main question? And the main question, um, and I'll let you think about that, and I'll be glad to discuss it uh, when, I, when I come back, but the main question in this case was not, does alcohol lower risk of diabetes? And all the other previous prospective studies on alcohol and diabetes, that was the main question. Does a baseline measure of alcohol predict who gets diabetes over the next 25 or 30 years. So that, that's not the question. This was a little bit more technical and a little bit more refined and I think spoke more to the science, the biology of, of the main question. So think about that one. So the real question one then is, you know, what are the advantages or disadvantages of using a cohort of male health professionals 
to test the hypothesis that alcohol consumption is causally inversely related to diabetes. And this is the one I sort of hinted at initially when I was describing the health professionals. You know, what is the advantage of using this type of cohort? These are dentists and veterinarians and optometrists from all across the United States. This is not NHANES, which is a national sample representing all of the U.S. So think about, you know, why would it be good to use health professionals and why might it not be good? And does your interpretation of the results change because you know this is health professionals as opposed to a sample of the general population? All right, question two. The way alcohol was assessed, I showed you we have diet questionnaires that we send out every four years. So alcohol was assessed with a food frequency questionnaire, which asked participants to report their average consumption over the last year. So what are the advantages or disadvantages of using this tool to study diabetes onset? So that's a challenge. A food frequency questionnaire does not say, what did you eat yesterday? Because no one's diet yesterday is, every, is, is really completely representative of their diet. So we've done a lot of work, and you'll see some references in the paper, to try to assess what it means to ask someone's diet over the last year. Does that really represent their true intake? And it's tricky because this is alcohol. Think about that. For the 60 or 70 percent of men who drink, they don't drink the same amount every day. There's differences across seasons. So think about, you know, is this a good tool? And what would you need to be convinced that this is a good tool to measure alcohol? Okay, so question three really speaks to the, the first table in the paper. So table one lists the other characteristics of men who increased and decreased their alcohol consumption. This can be really very helpful to understand confounding. So where do you see the greatest differences? And why might this be important to consider in the analysis interpretation? So why is it that some people increased and some people decreased? And are the increasers different from the decreasers? And if so, how did the authors handle that or account for that in their analysis? Those can be some really key points. And you know, there's lots of classic examples of that in the literature uh, of trying to deal with this in prospective observational cohort studies, because this was not a randomized trial. So of course, people who drink are slightly different than people who don't drink. You know, why is it that people don't drink? Why is it that people drink? Some of it's cultural. Some of it's that people metabolize alcohol differently. Some of it's it just doesn't make them feel well. They have a, a parent with a family history of alcohol abuse. All these reasons why people may drink or not drink. So the table one gets to some of those points. So see if you can pick out the key areas where there may be differences. All right, so question four is really just an interpretation question. And, and you know, that figure I showed you um, maybe was a little bit hard to understand at first. And it takes a while to kind of stare at that and think about what I was saying. So maybe you can go back to that part and look at it. But I want you to take table three, which is where I got the numbers to make that figure. And on the top row, there's a hazard ratio, which is 0.75. So in one sentence, what is the interpretation of that hazard ratio? What does that 0.75 mean uh, when thinking about that middle bar where they, they uh, had a lower risk of diabetes? So that should just be a one sentence answer. It shouldn't be a, a whole paragraph. All right, question five. Um, your interpretation provided in question four is based on observational data. So could this be tested in an experimental setting? So could you test our main question in an experimental setting? Now, people obviously will right away, you'll all laugh at that saying, oh, we can't randomly assign people to alcohol. Or can we? So could this be tested in an experimental setting? If yes, how and what would be the limitations? And some of them are obvious, but think about it. And if no, if you think this can't be tested in an experimental setting, why not? And what actually could be done experimentally to support the hypothesis? And you'll see a couple references in the paper where people have done some things experimentally. So read through that and think about where you would try to come up with an experimental study that could potentially mimic some of the results that we have here from the prospective cohort study. OK, I have one last question. So, and this is a tricky one. This is one I get asked a lot. So based on the results of this paper, should we recommend that all, drink, all adults drink moderately? Should there be national guidelines? In some countries, they actually have made national guidelines that people should drink moderately. So what are your thoughts on this? And, and, and some people have that initial gut reaction saying, oh, there's no way we can tell everybody to drink. But think about it. If you could reduce heart disease by 25 or 30 percent and reduce diabetes by 35 percent, I mean, diabetes is, rates are, rate, are, are rising exponentially in China and India and actually in, in middle-aged people in this country. 
with the obesity epidemic, there's huge increases in diabetes. So actually should we recommend that all, drinks, all adults drink moderately? Now, that's a challenging question. I, obviously, I won't be able to get to everybody's concerns. Um, and, but I, you know, if you really want to follow up on this, you can actually look at the USDA's dietary guidelines in 2010 to see how they actually make their recommendation around alcohol. But it gets at you know, what can you do based on the science, on the really good science that, we, that came out of this paper. All right, so I think that's it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, happy I had the, the time, and hopefully I, I gave you a pretty good explanation of the health professional's follow-up study and the, uh, the example of alcohol and diabetes that we had here, and I look forward to uh, you looking over your responses to the questions. Thank you.